so hi everyone, I'm Eloise. I am data scientist at uh, Quantmetry. Uh, this is our team. You've already seen it this morning by, uh, at uh, Mathieu and Isabel uh, presentation. And um, I am to tell you about uh, an experimental project that we, we, we did kind of for fun. Um, in addition to our consulting activities. Uh, but I am to tell you about some, some work uh, involving online learning, Vopa Wabbit and Hadoop. The uh, thing is that everyone is tired. Uh, this is the end of the conference, Coffee Break is coming, so I'm going to start with a, a story. So, a long time ago, in a country far, far away, after one of the most terrible conflicts the world has ever known, a few inspired men invented one of the greatest inventions of all time. The Turing machine. It actually wasn't really built. Um, but anyway, a few years later, uh, some guys came up with the first computer, and by, by 56, they were able to store three megabytes in big machines like that. Like kind of cool. So people thought we've got artificial intelligence solved. We're almost done. We people invented neural networks, and people thought, okay, we're gonna we're going to build intelligent system, clever, more clever than men, and uh, things are going to be uh, quite easy. Uh, in the end, it didn't work that well. Uh, so, next episode, uh, reality strikes back, and you don't have enough computing power, you don't have enough storage capacity, you don't have enough data, and your algorithms are not uh, efficient enough. So, in the end, we are still stuck with the regressions. People are doing regressions today. Okay, we, we still we, we do some more uh, some more fancy stuff right now. Right now, but still many people do regression. And uh, point is now we can do it fast. We can do it really fast and in a very efficient way. So that's what I want to talk today about. So you have a regression. What you do? Uh, it's simple, you have n samples, you have many features, and you want to predict a number. So you fit uh, a linear model, so you have uh, a model with some parameters called weights, and um, this model gives you a prediction, and you know reality, so you're going to, to see how much error you do. So you can do this on a simple regression, or you can, you can classify this. You can classify, you have zero, 01, you have red, blue, you have, um, if you're a critio, you're doing click or not click, uh, Shakespeare to be or not to be. Um, anyway, when you have a regression, you need to choose a loss function that's going to account for how much error your model does. So according to your use case, you choose different type of loss function that accounts for this error. You can choose, um, or, or uh, least square for if you're doing simple regression, or if you're, if you're doing classification, you choose logistic regression or hinge regression. There are many uh, type of uh, loss function you can choose, but in the end, this is a function that accounts for the error, and you want to minimize this. So you're, you're going to change your your weights are going to according to this. Traditionally, you have um, you're doing batch learning. So with batch learning, you have n samples. You have a model with some parameters, your weights. You initialize this. And when you initiate this, you load all your data sets into memory. And you, uh, you take a sample, you predict what your model says about this sample, and you compare it with reality. And that gives you the individual loss function of your sample. Then you do this for all your sample, and you accumulate everything into a global loss function. That gives you the global error of your model on the entire data set. Having computed this global uh, loss on the entire data set, you have some simple update rule 
that tells you how to change your weights in order to get your model to be closer to reality, to give better prediction. And you do this, uh, you do one iteration at a time, but computing, on, computing each time on the entire data set. And then you iterate many times. Each iteration involves the entire data set. You have many of these, and the complexity of each, each iteration is O of n. So it's very, uh, very expensive in terms of uh, computation. So to give you uh, a picture of what happens, this is the parameter space. So you have, you have two weights here, but you may have a higher dimensional space. And for each iteration, you're trying to find which is the direction that is going to bring you to the minimum of this last function. Because the minimum of the last function, here you have the contour of, uh, of your global last function, and you're trying to reach this place where this is where your error is minimal. But you can't do it straight, because otherwise you, you start at some point with your weights that are initiated, and and then you cannot choose a direction because you're not going to go straight to the minimum. So you need to do many iterations, one after the other, each time with a complexity of O of n, in order to find bit by bit to, to, to go down the slope of your loss function. And this is really expensive. And the problem is that you're working with the, your entire data set into, in memory. So what if uh, your data doesn't fit in memory? Uh, then you, you're stuck. You, you don't want to subsample because you may have many parameters, so you need all the data you can get to have a good predictive model. So I don't want to subsample my data. Uh, what if also you have a sample uh, a data set that fits in memory, but you have many features, and you want to combine them together? Maybe if you combine two features, it's going to give you a lot more information than just just one each, each of them. Or if you're doing natural language processing, you're going to want to combine words together. So you're doing n-grams, and this inflates your data set, and that may not fit in memory anymore. Uh, what can happen is also maybe sometime you, you train on the data set, and at some point someone gives you a new column. And you'd like to learn this new column, but you don't want to lose all, all, all of you what you have learned on the on the on the that I said before. So you'd like to be able to, end, to handle this kind of new features. You have also phenomena such as um, when your model drifts with time. You're trying to model something. Uh, for, ex for instance, the stock market is going to change with, with time. And you cannot learn a model long before and then predict uh, later because things have changed in the, in, the, in the meantime. So you'd like to do some kind of learning that can evolve, evolve with your phenomena. And so online learning is uh, one of the solutions to, to, to deal with that in a very efficient way. So it works the same way. Uh, you have n samples on, uh, and you have a predictive model that you initiate with some weights. Uh, and then you actually load just one sample, and you work on one sample at a time in memory. So you take the sample, you compute uh, with the prediction. You can compute the individual loss function uh, on this sample, but just this one. And have an update rule that just takes the individual loss. So, and, and you iterate a lot of time. So complexity. Uh, is just O of 1 because, kind of O of 1, because you just have one sample at a time. And to picture what's, what's going on there, on the global loss, because this is the global loss you want to minimize, if, if you work one sample at a time, the sample, you're minimizing the loss function of this sample. So you may not go in the direction uh, to the minimum of your global loss function, but you, on average, actually, you're going, you're going in the right direction. Maybe your sample is not representative enough of your entire data set. So you, you may wander around uh, your global last function. But in the end, you get there. Uh, 
And the thing is that you do it very often. Uh, you iterate many times on your data set, and you're going fast to the minimum. So you, you, you stabilize this kind of stochastic behavior. You stabilize this by doing many updates, uh, one, one sample at a time. So you approach the minimum very quickly. Problem with online learning is that you approach this minimum very quickly, but when, when you're there, you're still processing samples. So you get one sample, and this sample is going to tell you, OK, uh, you're there, but my minimum is, is not there, it's there. And then you move there by, with your update rule. And then you process another sample. This sample says, you know, my minimum is not there, it's there. So that's why you wander around your minimum, because what you're minimizing is the loss function of an individual sample at a time, and not the global uh, loss function. So that can be a problem uh, in principle, but in practice, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not so bad. So to give you an idea of a comparison between online learning and uh, batch learning, here in blue you have online learning, and in red you have batch learning. Here it's the accuracy of your model, so when you go right, your error is going to, uh, to diminish. And on y-axis, you have the training time. So online learning, to reach a given accuracy, online learning is a lot faster than batch learning, at least at the beginning, because it's going very fast to the minimum. And at some point, things cross. Batch learning becomes, more, becomes much more efficient to find the minimum, because it's noiseless. Online learning is going to continue wander around your minimum, while batch learning is slow to get there, but once it's there, it knows where it is. And a nice idea is to combine those two approaches, start with online learning, and then do a batch learning for the last few bits uh, of the last few steps to reach the minimum. So what I want to tell you uh, about is uh, a library that implements online learning and uh, that we, we started to use uh, a few months ago, um, which is called, so it's called Voba Wabbit. Voba Wabbit, it's a strange name, uh, but it's, um, it's an open source project that's been developed at Yahoo uh, by John Langford. It's written in C++ and it uh, implements online learning in a very, very efficient way. And as you can see, um, on, um, you can see, maybe you can't see so well for some people, but last year there was a, a really increase of uh, interest in Vopa Wabbit that uh, translates into the number of commits you can see on, on the project. So people really got excited about that. I'm going to tell you a bit uh, why, uh, why is it so interesting to use. So Vopa Wabbit has um, many algorithms implemented uh, in its system. So you have regression, you have fancy regression, you have k-means, you even have non-linear models such as uh, neural networks or SVM. So you've got basically, you've got everything, uh, you, you, you've got more than the basics of uh, machine learning in there. And it's implemented in a very efficient way uh, with clever algorithms such as BSGS, conjugate gradient, anyway, those clever uh, algorithms plus some tricks to, to do the learning in a very efficient way. It can also, it has the ability to combine features, uh, do n-grams, process text, and everything. And the other thing is that you, it has implemented by default some automatic tuning of your hyperparameters. The learning rate, uh, for instance, is how fast you go down to your minimum. And this is very critical in, in practice to, to train a, an algorithm, but it's very difficult to tune. It depends on your use case and, and everything. So actually, the default settings of Vopa Wabbit allow you to reach already an efficiency without much work. And that's very valuable when you start to discover data sets. You want to be efficient uh, very fast so you can tune uh, the last bit. And Vopa Wabbit is good for that because um, it's, it's kind of efficient by default in most cases. And it has some more features that are uh, pretty nice. 
Another thing is the input format. It looks a bit weird at the beginning, uh, but um, so so that's that's the kind of input you have to 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 give to the power bit. So here, you have uh, a label. It's one or minus one. You may have some weight; doesn't really matter. And then your features that are separated separated by pipes. So you can bundle your features together, give it numbers. It can process binary numerical features, categorical features, and it can process text uh, very easily. It can also handle um, missing values. Like here, you see you have two, two features, height and length, and here just have length. Doesn't matter for Vopal because uh, it doesn't expect to have all the features at uh, all times. So it handles this uh, sparse feature data set and uh, missing values very well. And that's quite valuable when you have a data set you want to discover because it allows you to just avoid some data preparation step you want to avoid when you start to, to try to understand what's, what's going on in your, uh, when you're data set and what you're trying to model. Um, so to summarize Volpawabit, it's um, an efficient library. You can do fast learning. Uh, in itself for scoring, that's what it was designed for, but also the other feature can allow you to uh, not s spend too much time to prepare your data to start to discover phenomenon. So it's also a very good tool for experimentation, maybe even if you plan to use a more complex model later, it's, it's quite nice. So you're fast, you're doing online learning with a fast, um, a fast uh, library, but uh, you'd, like to, you'd like to paralyze this. And um, so you'd like to paralyze uh, Vopal a bit. You can do it. Actually, it's been implemented in Vopal. Um, but why would you do this? So first, you, you're fast, but you want to speed up. You want to spread your jobs on different uh, nodes. So you'd like to be faster. Or maybe your data doesn't fit uh, in, your, in a single machine storage. Maybe you have one terabyte of data that doesn't fit in your laptop. And you don't want to subsample. Or you have data, you want to take advantage of this hybrid storage, so you don't move data, data, data around uh, your clusters. And the other, um, th the other reason you would want to parallelize is to take advantage of this dis distributed memory. Because on single machine, you don't have enough memory to maybe inflate your data set by combining features together. So how to do this? Um, so the idea is, uh, as I told you, uh, a nice idea is to combine online learning and batch learning. So you would send a job to many nodes, ask them to do an online pass to start learning on each one on its, uh, on its own data. And then you would like to send back the weights uh, that it has learned somewhere to average uh, the knowledge that each node has accumulated. So you combine this together, you average this, and you, bro you would broadcast down this average back to the nodes and maybe start uh, other learning, so do batch learning, and maybe do some iteration so, maybe, so, so you really reach your minimum of your loss function. And it's been implemented in Vobal Wabit project by John Longford and uh, some collaborators. Um, and uh, I will present this approach uh, that they used, they implemented, and give you a little um, uh, account for our experience using it. So what they wanted to do is to capitalize, to use both um, all reduce. Uh, which I'm going to tell you about later, uh, or reduce and map reduce. So what you need to do when you parallelize this, um, this thing is you, you want uh, an effective communication infrastructure because you need to communicate the weights between nodes and, uh, and everything. You need a data-centric data platform. So MapReduce is no good for that because you have full knowledge of the data location and it handles, handles things well. You want a fault tolerant system. And you, you want uh, some way to not to recode everything uh, because you've got uh, a nice implementation in C++ with, with Wabbit, and you don't want to recode all of your implementation, all your optimization uh, to Java or some uh, other language. So you, you, you'd like to be able to avoid rewriting everything. 
And all reduce, uh, so the combination of all reduce and map reduce uh, they use um, allows to, to, to do this parallelization. All reduce uh, is based on a communication structure in tree. Uh, so you have a tree, you build a tree on, over your nodes, and uh, each node has a number. It's like the result of the online pass, it's the weights. Uh, so uh, here you have one weight, but you have actually a vector of weights. And the first step, uh, e each one starts with a number, and the first step is to uh, the reduce step. So you want, you want to sum up your weights all the way up your tree in order to do the average. So you're going to sum up these uh, two children are going to send their number to the parents, and the parent is going to make the addition. So 8 and 8 and 1 is 17, and the other one sums up to 16. And then you do, uh, you do the sum up to the parents, and you end up with 34 at the top. And then the second step of our reduce is to broadcast down the result of your addition down to all your tree. And every node ends up with the sum of everybody, and they just need to divide by the number of uh, nodes to have the average of the number. So that's quite a simple idea, and that's why they, they, when they implemented this, they thought it was a good and efficient communication infrastructure to, uh, to build on. And combining with MapReduce, uh, that gives you um, the, the, the implementation of, uh, of uh, parallelization of OpalWabit on Hadoop. So you start your daemon, that's your communication system, and then you send your, no, uh, your job with MapReduce, actually you send just a mapper, you don't have a reducer, you just send a mapper to each node, and uh, each node is going to make an online pass over its data. Then you initialize your tree, your binary tree, that allows you to, uh, to send back your, your weights to the parents, to the master node. Uh, you use all reduce algorithm to average the weights over all the nodes. Uh, that's the result of the online pass. And then you send it back to all the nodes so that they can do their batch steps. So there are a few batch steps to do uh, in a row. And uh, so they do the, the, their batch step, they send back the weight, it, it's averaged, and then it's sent down again to the nodes so they can do another batch step, and you iterate. So the advantage of this implementation is that you have a minimal additional programming effort in the sense that you're using MapReduce, you're hacking somehow MapReduce just to send a mapper with a VopalWabit uh, command, asking VopalWabit that's installed on your, all, your, on your, all, all your nodes um, to, to do the job. So MapReduce is just kind of a way to send job and, and that's it. And uh, you capitalize on the data allocation knowledge of MapReduce uh, with this implementation. Um, all reduce allows you to have a small synchronization overhead because you have a tree, so you're in log of a uh, number of tree. So the time spent in all reduce operation is much lower than the computation time on each node. So you're fine. Uh, there are also tricks to use uh, to capitalize on Hadoop speculative execution to handle the problem with slow nodes and uh, dead nodes. That's quite clever. Uh, but I could, go, I could discuss that with you uh, later. I don't want to go into details. And combining online learning and batch learning gives you a rapid convergence because with online learning pass, you're reaching the surrounding of your minimum. And then batch learning helps you to do the last steps of the learning. So that's the theory. Um, and we thought, OK, it's cool. It's implemented. It's going to work. Uh, so you download uh, the code on GitHub. And um, in principle, it works. So you, you know the theory. You read paper. You understand how it works. And in principle, you start with daemon. There is a code in the GitHub called the spanning tree that set up your communication system. You launch your MapReduce job, you kill your spanning tree, and it works. And you're 
MapReduce job is using Hadoop streaming. It's, it's very simple. You want speculative execution. You don't have any register input output that's simple. You load a few uh, libraries that Vopal Webit needs to work. And uh, you give it a mapper, and that's it. But it doesn't work uh, that well. So first, we decided to use uh, Amazon Web Services to do this. Um, but honestly, it was the first time we, wiz we used it. It's a bit different than the usual Hadoop cluster we were used to. With, the, uh, with uh, Amazon, what you do is you use transient cluster. So instead of having your cluster up and running and sending job and um, monitoring what's, what's going on, what you have is your data on S3 buckets. And you start an EMR um, cluster, you start your cluster, you may bootstrap some actions like installing uh, libraries such as Vopal Webit and other things. You need some configuration, so you can just do it with uh, simple scripts. And then you run your job. That's called step in, uh, in the Amazon Web Services. And when the job is done, you shut down your cluster. So actually, your cluster is only live during, it's, it's live only during the time of your MapReduce job, and then it's killed afterwards. So it's a bit weird when you're not used to it. It has some advantages and it has some drawbacks. Advantages is that it's easy to set up, you, it works, you don't have to do maintenance, it's low cost. Uh, problem is that we, we, we really struggle to find the logs. Uh, the logs are easy to find on Hadoop cluster because you know where they are, what they are. And it took us some time to, to, to figure out where to find them. And there is some configuration that's not by default. You need to set up a uh, debugging, uh, debugging option in Amazon. So really read uh, the doc of Amazon, because otherwise it's difficult to find. So once we, 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 we got uh, this uh, Amazon cluster up and running, you, you need to make it work. So Vopa Webit uh, needs um, to, to work. It needs MapReduce environment variables. It needs to know the number, the total number of, um, of tasks, uh, because it just needs to divide the, the sum of our, uh, all nodes by the number of nodes. So each node needs to, to know that. It, it needs to know some IDs. It needs to know the private DNS of uh, the parents and the children. Uh, in order to communicate with all reduce. Um, and so the problem is that um, this implementation of uh, parallelization of Opal Webit was done for Hadoop 1, and the name of, um, name of the environment variable changed. So you have to change and you have to find out, uh, change a bit the code that you can find on GitHub. And the, map reduce, the mapper that you have is uh, written in shell, in bash, and uh, getting the environment variables were not possible. So we had to hack a, a bit with uh, Python to, to really get this uh, thing. It took us some time to figure out what, what was the problem. Another problem uh, that you have when you try to run this is the number of splits. You need to brute force um, the MapReduce job to, uh, to do the number of splits you, you want. That means the number, you, ne you need the number of splits to be equal to um, the number of nodes you want to do your job on. Uh, and we got some hints from uh, John Langford code because he was kind of computing this uh, by, uh, by inside the code and using this option, but it doesn't work anymore. So we kind of did, uh, we, were, we were short in time, so we did a dirty workaround to split the data and put everything into a GZ file, because GZ files are not, um, are not uh, splittable. So MapReduce won't try to split it more than you want. And uh, there was a last uh, thing. Uh, if you try to run it, there is a, an option called, um, called um, uh, that involves the number, how, how much RAM you want to uh, allocate to Vopa Wabit. And this, I haven't figured out what's the problem uh, with it yet. Uh, but you have to be aware of this uh, RAM allocation uh, also that does work very well on a single machine, even if you parallelize on a single machine, but doesn't work anymore on Hadoop. 
being aware of that, we solved uh, all this. And as you can see, it's, uh, it, it, it works. So here, this is the log from the node. So this, is, this comes from Vopal Wabit. And here you can see uh, it's the IP number of the node. It starts training and does some stuff. So it gives you some parameters uh, it's going to use. And there, it starts online learning. And when it's done, when it's done, when it's completed, so the, the first line is the last line of all the, uh, all the paths of our data set, it connects to its parents, sends its weights, waits for the answer from the parents, because uh, parents are going to send back the, the average. Um, and then it tells you some how, on how much examples it, uh, it, it, it has been working. And then you do the batch, the batch part. So BFGS is a kind of an implementation of batch learning. It learns, it connects to its parents, it waits for the answer uh, with the sum over all nodes. And when you reach the number of uh, steps you've set, you, it stops and uh, sends the results uh, back, to, uh, back to the master node. So uh, I tried uh, to do a benchmark. Actually, this was done yesterday at uh, 2 a.m. <laughs> Uh, so uh, a bit short, but um, so I've tried. I, I haven't uh, been able with the hotel uh, to upload a lot of data on Hadoop, but just with six gigabytes, uh, that means uh, 15, uh, 50 million example, uh, running on uh, 52 billion uh, uh, features means that I've done many combination of all these features. Uh, on a single machine means on my laptop. Uh, was able to run this with just online learning in 26 minutes. And on Hadoop, it, uh, it worked in six minutes. So it does speed up uh, a lot. And you have to take into account that this was quite a small data set. And on larger data set, it should really speed up your online learning uh, path for similar, um, similar accuracy. So to conclude, um, about online learning. Online learning is, uh, is fine when, whenever you, your computation time is the bottleneck of your job, then you should use the online learning. Even if your laptop, even if you have enough RAM, it's always good to, uh, to use online learning because you can, then you can process more data and you can include more feature, more combination in your analysis. And that's very useful for scoring, but also very useful for research and experimentation on a data set. Um, and working this project, uh, we got to really understand what was going on, so understand the basic of optimization algorithm, and understand a lot on uh, how to put this on Hadoop. So we, we really were uh, very interesting. And those guys, Langford, Le, uh, Leon Botu, Agarwal, they really did a lot of work in, uh, in implementing this and uh, speeding, speeding up online learning. So the last uh, episode is coming soon. Um, there are still things to debug uh, on the code, but um, we, we are going to do some pushes on GitHub. So if you are interested, just uh, it's going to come soon when we solve the last uh, bit of problems. And um, what we would like to do is, uh, of course, benchmark on a very large data set, more, uh, more, just more large uh, data set than they are available. There are solutions such as GraphLab and uh, MLLeap that implement online learning. And we would like to know how, uh, how Vopa Webit compares with, with this, uh, this solution. And um, so if you have any question, I'm, uh, I'm done. And thank you for uh, listening. Uh, any questions?